I have been binding for almost two years now. Binding has allowed me to experience gender euphoria for the first time at the cost of back aches and trouble breathing. Binding has also given me the space to consider if top surgery is something I want. After weeks of research on chest binding, I learned of the risks and joys it can bring to our trans mask and non-binary communities. I thought, why is no one talking about this more? I found so much comfort in these articles because they were able to give names to my experience and validate my love-hate relationship with binding and my chest. Research tells us that binding helps alleviate chest dysphoria. Chest dysphoria is when an individual experiences physical and emotional discomfort and distress caused by the presence of unwanted breast development. Dysphoria is known to cause strong negative emotions and can trigger suicidal ideation. Binding can help. For folks who don't know what binding is, there are several techniques that have been used, from trans taping, ace bandaging, which is not recommended, please don't do it, and binders created specifically to help with chest dysphoria. However, although binding helps to alleviate psychological distress, this comes at a cost to our physical body. Binders are physically uncomfortable and many reported adverse health effects such as pain in the chest, ribs, back, or shoulders difficulty breathing, skin rashes, or irritation, overheating, and decreased endurance. But some folks will take the physical pain over the mental drainage that is caused by dysphoria. However, when it came down to it, my heart was telling me to explore on a deeper and more personal level. So I sought out to interview folks in the non-binary and trans mask community to hear about their personal relationship to their chest and binding. I'm here to add to the much needed continuation of this conversation. In this documentary, we are shown the perspective of three non-binary individuals and one gender queer individual who talk about their relationship with their chest and history with binding. My name is Aiden Rose. My pronouns are he, him, and they, them, and my identity is non-binary. My name is Rentaro. Uh, my pronouns are he, they, and I just generally identify as queer, gender queer. My name's Canyon. I use they, them pronouns, um, and I am trans and non-binary. My name is Agog. I'm non-binary. I go by they, them. I did choose my chosen name as Agog. It means to be eagerly looking into things, eager to discover things. I'm pretty into other people, learning about them, their multi-complexities and things like that. Eccentric would be the first thing that comes to mind. I, I think more like when it comes to my appearance than my personality, but I think eccentric is a pretty decent way to describe myself. One word I use to describe myself. Hmm. I think I would pick kind. I would use to describe myself confused. <laughs> okay, let's go with inquisitive. Being genderqueer is not adhering to the rules and the expectations that were put on you against your will just because of the genitalia that you were born with and it's stepping outside of those expectations and realizing that there's so much more than the, the gender roles that were just like just like this is what it is and this is how you're gonna be and this is how you're gonna act this is how you're gonna present i think just simply put it's just like defying all expectations and unlearning the things that were just imposed on you against your will i don't have to be put into any societal box and I can make up the definition of what is masculine or feminine. I still do get challenged and you know like at every point just because this is who I am like I am I have the freedom to be myself my true self and then I feel comfortable and I don't think that I've ever felt uncomfortable since I 
start identifying as non-binary because there's not so much pressure to conform to either side of it. I just kept running my hands down my chest and I took a ton of pictures, like my entire camera roll was just a flat chest and a shirt. Um, research, YouTube, YouTube and Tumblr were like my best friends back in like the 2010s, you know, when it came to trying to figure out what my identity was and what presenting as myself was supposed to look like. I probably binded for about a year. I would buy in pretty regularly. It was, it was kind of hard though because I'm a dancer, so like, I, the moment that I got my binder, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> like, I did not realize that this was even something, like I didn't realize that this was a feeling that I could even have or like would enjoy this much or like the way that it would make me feel. Uh, most of the like women in my family having breast enhancements and me being like, oh, this is normal for people to like not feel comfortable in their bodies and have a strange relationship with their chest. So like I was like, yeah, I, I, I got that. And I knew that like I was really sad a lot about like my body, um, but I didn't really understand why. It took like a really long time for me to like understand those parts of myself. Um, and it wasn't until like like I said, like, definitely when I came out as queer, I was like, ooh, world of difference. Okay, great, you know? And then when I came out as non-binary and trans, I was like, oh shit, like, are you unhappy with your chest? Like, is this why you're unhappy with your chest? And then I had to kind of like put the puzzle pieces together to, to recognize. I, I think that I fall into the trope of binder care that is the stinky binder. <laughs> Sadly, uh, I, I just wash it. I don't, it's kind of falling apart. I, I don't know if that's normal. Definitely making sure you have at least enough in rotation to keep it washed like once, if not twice a week, because it's a very specific experience. <laughs> and the way that you like sweat in binders and the way that you just feel in them in general. You look up after like two or three days and it's like, oh, this is disgusting. I still have to wear it, <laughs> like. Just like, I don't know, I lost my mind. I like, was like laughing hysterically. It felt like, like a therapy <laughs> session. Like I was like laughing hysterically and sobbing and just like standing at different points in the room. I don't know if you've ever been in a dance studio before, but it's literally just like a wall of mirrors and just like walking to different points in the mirror, just like turning to the side and like staring at myself and sobbing and turning to the side and laughing and like standing at like all of the different points in the room. Um, yeah, it was incredible. It was amazing. Examples of euphoria I felt in a binder would be the outfits. Suddenly I could wear so many outfits that I did not feel comfortable wearing before, um, just because of the way that my chest was shaped in them. And I felt comfortable wearing crop tops and like more feminine like clothing and like makeup even. And like, I just got to explore my feminine sides and be more comfortable in the feminine parts of me because I never left. Putting on clothes now is like the most exciting thing in the world. I've been like saving articles of clothing like, you know, for like far too long. And I was like, yeah, I really love this, but I don't like the way my chest looks in it. And I can't wear a binder underneath it because like of the way that it shows or like the line or whatever. So I, I just like can't, but I'm just gonna hold on to it just in case. And like now putting on all of those clothes, I'm like, what? <laughs> like, um, it's very cool. I'm binding my relationship. It gets better. <laughs> it's 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 much better. It's the uh, honeymoon cycle of the relationship, and we're together and we're one. When I'm when I'm binding and I turn to the side and I look at myself, all my outfits look better. I stand up straighter. I have really bad posture, but my confidence skyrockets, and I just feel like this is another tool for me to love myself because this is me getting closer to who I am. Like that first year was probably the most euphoric time of my life. I didn't wear a shirt anywhere. <laughs> Everywhere I went, 
it, I was at least gonna drive there shirtless and then put my clothes on when I got there. <laughs> like, I was, I was very, very just, it really, it was something that I'd always wanted to be able to just feel free in my body in public and something that had never really been afforded to me before. So like prior to top surgery, I would wear binders out and sometimes I would just wear my binder as if it were a tank top or a t-shirt. Um, but then afterwards it was, as soon as they cleared me to, uh, <laughs> to not have the uh, compression shirt on, I was just walking around with the nipple tape and the, the scar tape and I was just like, you got questions, just ask them because I'm gonna, th I've waited way too long to feel comfortable in my body. If I had to like talk to my chest, I would say you've gotten me very far and I want to honor that in that like I don't always want to feel like I need a binder because I think that that thinking in itself is kind of it's complicated and it's it's there's a lot of layers to it but I think myself as a whole too I want to honor the parts of me that got me here that got me to get the binder that got me to feel comfortable in a binder and I think Overall, I just feel a sense of like acceptance and like respect, honestly, for my chest and how far it got me. I start to feel like there's like knives like dragging my back or like my skin is being pulled. Give you anxiety, I read too. Like your binder can give you anxiety from you not being able to fully extend your breath. To me, it kind of just feels like like putting a seatbelt on, like, all right, like we're going out, we're, we're y'all good, like we're tucked in. I don't know, I feel like when I put a binder on, I'm like to my chest, I'm like, thanks. Like, I know this is uncomfortable, um, but I feel damn good. Is chest binding a trade-off between mental wellness and physical discomfort? For myself, speaking for me only, absolutely. I, I can vividly remember times where I would go out with friends or go out on dates i would literally like excuse myself to the restroom just so i could pull the binder off of my chest and <sighs> I'm like oh this is what a deep breath feels like i haven't felt that in hours and i would take a few deep breaths and then i would go back out to you know whatever i was doing and just try and like pace my breathing so i didn't get too lightheaded i think that no matter what it's going to be uncomfortable <laughs> um, um, at least in my experience so yeah, I guess it doesn't feel like a trade-off. It feels like um, like the lesser of two evils, I guess. I was never really as uncomfortable with my body as I was uncomfortable in how society viewed and sexualized my body. So depending on the space that I was in, I would still walk around shirtless yeah, uh, I, I did have like certain friends where I would go like camping and fishing with them and knew that I could feel comfortable being shirtless without being sexualized or feeling uncomfortable. Um, because my my dysphoria, and I realized this much later, that was, it, it, had, it was a lot, it was much more of a social dysphoria than it was an internal dysphoria. Like before I came out, and even like once I, I came out, I like tried really hard to be like, toxically positive about my body and was like you love yourself so much you just you're gonna learn to love these parts of yourself that's what you're gonna do and like really tried to like find the things that I could like um, be have like gratitude with and like the things that I could like hold on to that um, could be positive that was easier to do when I was alone, but I think that it's a lot harder when you're like in social settings. I would, you know, put my binder on, go to the gym with my boys, go to the gym with my brother, and then I come home, they're working out in like a tank top or with no shirt on, and I'm working out with my binder and like a t-shirt or something on over it. And then I come home and I would just feel like less than, for lack of a better way of putting it. And so it definitely solidified for me that having top surgery was something that I really, really needed to do for me to feel more secure in myself and in my body. Definitely not looking in the mirror has to do with the chest dysphoria, just because I've, like I said, I've made my own peace with it, but 
it can get very like critical like sometimes i think in general most people don't really oh, i'm not really sure but i don't think most people are, have a great relationship with their body where they love everything about their body so it just kind of um adds to that where it's like maybe in general i didn't really like my body and now i really don't like my body because it's not next to or close to how i identify or my idea of it every single day but it, you know it's definitely part of the reason why i don't look into it because i don't want to hate myself <laughs> you know even if I said like it's more about who I am than the body I'm carrying around on earth. I don't want to dive into the depressive side of it. When I got top surgery, I was still covered by my parents' insurance. So that made the process a lot easier. My top surgery cost $100 out of pocket, which is like unheard of. I had the money for it, like I put it in my savings account and I was like, I'm not touching this, I'm gonna get this surgery. Like, I wasn't making much at the time, so like putting that away was a lot. My, my dad actually paid for my top surgery. I would say it took me about eight to 10 months from when I like first decided that I wanted it and actually like took the steps towards meeting with my, my therapist and, and getting that letter and all that, which because I had been seeing her uh, to get my hormones, she didn't make me do, go through another year. She was like, I already know you have gender dysphoria. I already know that you're trans. I already know that your identity is valid, so I'm not going to make you go through a whole year of trying to prove it to me. Um, we discussed just the details, the pros and the cons and that kind of stuff. And then she gave me my referral. It's a lot of emotional labor to just jump through all the hoops and ladders and and make 400 different calls in a day and still be in the same place that you started. And um, that's kind of been my experience thus far and I really haven't gotten much further than that because of how messed up it's been. The way that our healthcare system is set up and with the low cost like insurance options that I have and that, that I go through, it's like great that I have them, but also they're kind of designed to be confusing. I don't know, it just, the, the angriest, the most infuriating thing to me is just how not streamlined it is and how, how many times, how many calls do you have to make? How many people do you have to repeat the same information you've been repeating to like, yeah. Before I got a binder, I wasn't even certain that I wanted top surgery at all. I had always had like a pretty small chest um, and was like, this is something that's like manageable. I can live with this. Um, and then the moment I got a binder, I was like, <laughs> wait, <laughs> what? <laughs> um, once again, nobody told me, <laughs> nobody told me about this. Um, so yeah, immediately I was just like, oh, I didn't realize the way that this would make me feel. I didn't realize like what a significant change it would make in my life. Like I absolutely want top surgery. Within the first like three weeks of top surgery, let alone the first like hour or so of having it, was I did this to try and push myself up in the bed. And I was cut, obviously, all the way under here because I had the double incision and um, it, I, I tried to lift myself up and I physically did not have the strength to do it and I just flopped back. And then I tried again and the nurse was like, no, 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 no. Stop, stop what you're doing, stop what you're doing. <laughs> and I was, the drug, those hospital drugs are really good. That didn't process to me, you know? And um, so she put some Benadryl in my IV and just knocked me back out. And the next thing I know about an hour later, I'm waking up to my whole family, my mom, my grandmother, my dad, and my brother in the room with me. And I'm sitting up, in the bed at this point and they got me up and they moved me to this chair and they're giving me the whole rundown on the drains and how to empty them and drain them out how much blood i should be looking for every day what the red flags are if i see any like signs of clotting and stuff like that um any signs of a hematoma those sorts of things like i said the hospital drugs are really good i didn't retain any of it but my brother he did he was like mentally just taking notes on everything and then up to like the night before surgery, literally the night before surgery, I was like, <sighs> having a panic attack, obviously.
obviously. And I was like, is this even like right? Like, is this even what I want? Like, I'm somebody who can still just like questioning and also like imposter syndrome. Like, I can live with my body. Like, I can make this work. Like, for so long, I thought that this was fine and like I didn't think twice about it and like. You know, I could really make this work. Like, I could use this money. I could give this to somebody else. Like, maybe I, is this right? Like, literally until like the the night before, like going to bed thinking that, and then like waking up from surgery and just like I don't know. Those first few days don't feel very real. You don't feel like I don't know. I, I didn't even think that it really happened. Like I was like, yeah, I just went through this like huge surgery, but it still didn't feel like it was real until I saw my chest for the first time. And then it was immediately like, how could I ever even think those thoughts? Like, how could I ever even say that about myself? Like how hard have I been conditioned to just like not even like honor myself in that way or not even like trust that I deserve things without condition. Just trust that if you're in a stage of being uncertain, that it's necessary for you and that it's necessary to your process and that you will get to where you need to be eventually. My, my number one advice would be to take your time and then also know that there's no like there's no specific demographic that does or doesn't deserve top surgery. So like non-binary lesbians or cis lesbians or trans men or trans mass people or however you identify, if you feel that top surgery is going to be good for you, then you know take the steps to do the necessary research and then take the steps to actually make that happen for you. And don't feel like, oh, well, I'm not mask enough or I don't present in a way that society will still see me as valid. It's not about, it's about you. Um, I felt a little bit of fear and I think it's just because not so much that it wasn't like, oh, this is something that I want to do. This is true to my identity. But as far as how I grew up, within you know we all grew up within very strict gender male female um and then the expectations that come with that i was scared to push and find myself and grab at the straws of what i am in between that so um i was kind of finding as experimentation because i don't think i was um going well i was i had just come out as non-binary and then i was like i'm not really sure if this will bring me closer to who I am or farther. So I bought a binder and then I put it on and it was euphoric. <laughs> Before she passed away, my great grandmother, she was a registered nurse, like I said. She did my shots up until she passed away. She would do my shots for me every every that was two, every two weeks before I switched to the gym. Um, and then she even taught my, my girlfriend at the time how to do it so that she could do them for me anytime that, you know, if we weren't able to get to her side of town, that kind of stuff. So she was always very supportive of me. Um, like from junk, from when I first came out. My mom as well. She cried initially because I had to tell her also the name that I want to go by and they do mourn that idea of like, I named you this and this is who I know you as and even if I don't really like that name, that's who you are to me. I had to walk away, I think, at the end of the conversation because I was trying to reiterate that it's not really about her, even though I am her child, you know, I'm not an extension of her, I'm just her child. You know, I don't expect society to love me and I don't expect society to, su to support me. But I know that at least, you know, when I come home to be with my loved ones that I don't have to deal with that. And something that I was thinking of as I heard that question and we were talking about it was how I started early in my transition wearing my binder every single day for like 10 hours, seven days a week, to now I rarely wear it at all. And I think that's really interesting because I think it, it correlates to the people that I've surrounded myself with and how much more comfortable 
I feel the binder took me there. It put me through discomfort. It put me through literally moving my ribs and just so much pain and everything. And it was, there were like training wheels. It was like, I put, I put my training wheels on and now I can, I can just ride, <laughs> you know? If I were to go back, I would say that something that helped me a lot was just being able to look at videos of other trans men and trans masculine folks that talked about how, that were just transparent in their experiences. I write down lists of like, the things, the traits of myself that are not related to my body as far as, you know, like creativity, um, being family oriented or um, being social, being um, driven to things. So like things that aren't so directly tied to like the physical aspect of me, things that I like about myself, then that really helps a lot and it builds my self-esteem because I'm like, okay, these things aren't things that are going to change and these are good things. and. I just carry that with me. I hope that they start doing more research about the long-term effects of wearing the binder so at least we can know because I've tried to google you know what are the effects and it's kind of like obvious like you're gonna be shortness of breath you might be like maybe a little lightheaded and it's like oh I know that that makes my muscles sore but like long term like what is this really doing to my body because for people who don't want chest surgery and or you know might never be able to afford chest surgery it's very important that they know what they're doing to their body. Well, in the future, I hope that binders are just safer <laughs> for everyone. Um, and we've come a long way from like ace bandages, you know, and binding is definitely better. And now there's like KT tape that people use that have been said to be, be like safer. Um, but it's still really taxing physically, like on the body. And I would hope that there's just. I don't know, science will do its thing and come up with a better, newer option that won't, like, make it hard to breathe sometimes. That would be nice. Yes, I would like my ribs to stay where they are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hope that, like, the society that we live in is different and <laughs> on so many levels and that things like um, the binary gender are um, pushed less on humans so that they don't feel the need to, I don't know, so that they recognize that like all bodies are made differently and like we're not like pressuring any type of body to feel or present in any way or act in any way. I hope that if people still want to use binder that there's like obviously a way that we can do it safely and that there's like more access to them, that they're not like so far out of reach. Like you can like maybe like walk to the store and buy a binder, like you can like most undergarments. The lack of education around how that can be harmful, I think is really detrimental and leads to a lot of health problems for a community that does not necessarily have the healthcare to support having those kinds of problems. That you need it to be complete for people to see you the way that you want to be seen. Although like I do know how important that can be and it, it like it's important to me. Um, but I think there is a strength in just like knowing that I'm still me without it and knowing that I'm still genderqueer without it. I think that Everyone in the community hopes that top surgery will become more affordable and maybe even kind of like covered by insurance. It's not like a cosmetic thing, it's to bring someone closer to who they are and it is life or death in some situations, you know, people don't, they can't live in their bodies comfortably and that's an everyday thing, that's a mental health thing. It should be more affordable if it's not going to be covered by insurance. Just have like a note from your doctor that you are you have transness, like you are diagnosed with transness so that you can literally get surgeries that like people alter their bodies every day and nobody questions them about. Like cis people alter their bodies all the time and nobody questions them about. Okay, obviously that, um, uh, that healthcare in general can just be more accessible. The fact that my experience 
with getting top surgery was rare is really a problem. Like I was really fortunate. A hundred dollars, got it within a couple of months, have the support of my family. Like, I have more trans folks in my life that will never experience that than I have that might in some way experience some something similar to that. And and really it shouldn't be like that. It really shouldn't be. Silent strength. 